from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Spider by Hans Heinz Ewers When Richard Brackamont, medical student, decided to move into room number 7 of the Little Hotel Stevens at 6 Rue Alfred Stevens, three people had already hanged themselves from the window sash of the room on three successive Fridays. The first was a Swiss traveling salesman. His body was not discovered until Saturday evening. But the physician established the fact that death must have come between 5 and 6 o'clock on Friday afternoon. The body hung suspended from a strong hook which had been driven into the window sash and which ordinarily served for hanging clothes. The window was closed and the dead man had used the curtain cord as a rope. Since the window was rather low, his legs dragged on the ground almost to his knees. The suicide must consequently have exercised considerable willpower in carrying out his intention. It was further established that he was married and the father of four children, that he unquestionably had an adequate and steady income, and that he was of a cheerful disposition and well contented in life. Neither a will nor anything in writing that might give a clue to the cause of the suicide was found nor had he ever intimated leanings towards suicide to any of his friends or acquaintances. The second case was not very different. The actor, Carl Krauss, who was employed at the nearby Cirque Medrano as a lightning bicycle artiste, engaged number seven, two days after the first suicide. When he failed to appear at the performance the following Friday evening, the manager of the theater sent an usher to the little hotel. The usher found the actor hanged from the window sash in the unlocked room in identically the same circumstances that had attended the suicide of the Swiss traveling salesman. This second suicide seemed no less puzzling than the first. The actor was popular, drew a very large salary, was only 25 years old, and seemed to enjoy life to the utmost. Again, nothing was left in writing nor were there any other clues that might help solve the mystery. The actor was survived only by an aged mother, to whom he used to send 300 marks for her support promptly on the first of each month. From Madame du Bonnet, who owned a cheap little hotel, and whose clientele was made up exclusively of the actors of the nearby vaudeville of Montmartre, this second suicide had very distressing consequences. Already several of her guests had moved out and other regular customers had failed to come back. She appealed to the commissioner of the Ninth Ward, whom she knew well, and he promised to do everything in his power to help her. So he not only pushed his investigation of reasons for the suicides with considerable zeal, but he also placed at her disposal a police officer who took up residence in the mysterious room. It was the policeman, Charles Maria Chamey, who had volunteered his services in solving the mystery. An old Marasan, who had been a Marine infantryman for 11 years, this sergeant had guarded many a lonely post in Tonkin and Anam single-handed, and had greeted many an uninvited deputation of river pirates, sneaking like cats through the jungle darkness with a refreshing shot from his rifle. Consequently, he felt himself well healed to meet the ghosts of which the Rue Stevens gossiped. He moved into the room on Sunday evening and went contentedly to sleep after doing high justice to the food and drink Madame de Bonnet set before him. Every morning and evening, Chalmay paid a brief visit to the police station to make his reports. 
during the first few days his reports confined themselves to the statement that he had not noticed even the slightest thing out of the ordinary. On Wednesday evening, however, he announced that he believed he had found a clue. When pressed for details, he begged to be allowed to say nothing for the present. He said he was not certain that the thing he thought he had discovered necessarily had any bearing on the two suicides, and he was afraid of being ridiculed in case it should all turn out to be a mistake. On Thursday evening, he seemed to be even more uncertain, although somewhat graver, but again he had nothing to report. On Friday morning, he seemed quite excited, half seriously and half in jest. He ventured the statement that the window of the room certainly had a remarkable power of attraction. Nevertheless, he still clung to the theory that the fact had nothing whatever to do with the suicides, and that he would only be laughed at if he told more. That evening, he failed to come to the police station. They found him hanged from the hook on the window sash. Even in this case, the circumstances, down to the minutest detail, were again the same as they had been in the other cases. The legs dragged on the floor, and the curtain cord had been used as a rope. The window was closed, and the door had not been locked. Death had evidently come at about six o'clock in the afternoon. The dead man's mouth was wide open, and his tongue hung out. As a consequence of this third suicide in room number seven, all the guests left the Hotel Stevens that same day, with the exception of the German high school teacher in room number 16, who took advantage of this opportunity to have his rent reduced one-third. It was small consolation for Madame de Bonnet to have Mary Garden, the famous star of the Opera Comique, drive by in her Renault a few days later and stop to buy the red curtains cords for a price she beat down to 200 francs. Of course, she had two reasons for buying it. In the first place, it would bring luck. And in the second, well, it would get into the newspapers. If these things had happened in summer, say in July or August, Madame de Bonnet might have got three times as much for her curtain cord. At that time of the year, the newspapers would certainly have filled their columns with a case for weeks. But at an uneasy time of the year, with the elections, disorders in the Balkans, a bank failure in New York, a visit of the English king and queen, well, where could the newspapers find room for a mere murder case? The result was that the fair in the Rue Stevens got less attention than it deserved, and such notices of it as appeared in the newspapers were concise and brief, and confined themselves practically to repetitions of the police reports without exaggerations. These reports furnished the only basis for what little knowledge of the affair the medical student Richard Brackmont had. He knew nothing of one other little detail that seemed so inconsequential that neither the commissioner nor any of the other witnesses had mentioned it to the reporters. Only afterwards, after the adventure the medical student had in the room, was this detail remembered. It was this. When the police took the body of Sergeant Charles Maria Chamay down from the window sash, a large black spider crawled out of the mouth of the dead man. The porter flicked it away with his finger, crying, Ah, another such ugly beast. In the course of the subsequent autopsy, that is, the one held later for Bracamont, the reporter told that when they had taken down the corpse of the Swiss traveling salesman, a similar spider had been crawling on his shoulder. But of this Richard Bracamont knew nothing. He did not take up his lodging in the room until two weeks after the last suicide on a Sunday. What he experienced there, he entered very conscientiously in a diary. The Diary of Richard Bracamont, Medical Student Monday, February 28 I moved in here last night. I unpacked my two, two suitcases, put a few things in order, and went to bed. I slept superbly. The clock was just striking nine when a knock at the door wakened me. It was the landlady who brought me my breakfast herself. She is evidently quite solicitous about me, judging from the eggs, the ham, and the splendid coffee she brought me. I washed and dressed, and then watched the porter make up my room. I smoked my pipe while he worked. So here I am. 
I know right well that this business is dangerous, but I know too that my fortune is made if I solve the mystery. And if Paris was once worth a mass, one could hardly buy it that cheaply nowadays. It might be worth risking my little life for it. Here is my chance, and I intend to make the most of it. At that, there were plenty of others who saw this chance. No less than 27 people tried, some through the police, some through the landlady, to get the room. Three of them were women, so there were enough rivals, probably all poor devils like himself. But I got it. Why? Oh, I was probably the only one who could offer a solution to the police. A neat solution. Of course, it was a bluff. These entries are, of course, intended for the police, too. And it amuses me considerably to tell these gentlemen right at the outset that I was all a trick on my part. If the commissioner is sensible, he will say, hmm, just because I knew he was tricking us, I had all the more confidence in him. As far as that is concerned, I don't care what he says afterward. Now I'm here, and it seems to me a good omen to have begun my work by bluffing the police so thoroughly. Of course, I first made my application to Madame Dubonnet, but she sent me to the police station. I lounged about the station every day for a week, only to be told that my application was being given consideration and to be asked always to come back again next day. Most of my rivals had long since thrown up the sponge. They probably found some better way to spend their time than waiting for hour after hour in the musty police court. But it seems the commissioner was by this time quite irritated by my perseverance. Finally, he told me point blank that my coming back would be quite useless. He was very grateful to me as well as to all the other volunteers for our good intentions. But the police could not use the assistance of dilettante laymen. Unless I had some carefully worked out plan of procedure. So I told him that I had exactly that kind of plan. Of course I had no such thing and couldn't have explained a word of it. But I told him that I could tell him about my plan. Which was good although dangerous, and which might possibly come to the same conclusion as the investigation of the police sergeant, only if he could promise me on his word of honor that he was ready to carry it out. He thanked me for it, but regretted that he had no time for such things. But I saw that I was getting the upper hand when he asked me whether I couldn't at least give him some intimation of what I planned doing, and I gave it to him. I told them the most glorious nonsense of which I myself hadn't had the least notion even a second beforehand. I don't know even now how I came by this unusual inspiration so opportunely. I told them that among all the hours of the week, there was the one that had a secret and strange significance. That was the hour in which Christ left his grave to go down to hell the sixth hour of the afternoon of the last day of the Jewish week. And he might take into consideration, I went on, that it was exactly in this hour between five and six o'clock on Friday afternoon, and which all three of the suicides had been committed. For the present, I could not tell him more, but I might refer him to the book of Revelations according to St. John. The commissioner put on a wise expression as if he had understood it all, thanked me, and asked me to come back in the evening. I came back to his office promptly at the appointed time. I saw a copy of the New Testament lying in front of him on the table. In the meantime, I had done just what he had. I had read the book of Revelations through and had not understood a word of it. Perhaps the commissioner was more intelligent than I. At least he told me that he understood what I was driving at in spite of my very vague hints and that he was ready to grant my request and to aid me in every possible way. I must admit that he has actually been of very considerable assistance. He has made arrangements with a landlady under which I am to enjoy all the comforts and facilities of the hotel free of charge. He has given me an exceptionally fine revolver and a police pipe. The policemen on duty have orders to go through the little Rue Alfred Stevens as often as possible and to come up to the room at a given signal. But the main thing is his installation of a desk telephone that connects directly with the police station. 
since the station is only four minutes walk from the hotel. I am thus enabled to have all the help I want immediately. With all this, I can't understand what there is to be afraid of. Tuesday, March 1st. Nothing has happened, neither yesterday nor today. Madame de Bonnet brought me a new curtain cord from another room. Heaven knows she had enough of them vacant. For that matter, she seems to take every possible opportunity to come to my room. Every time she comes, she brings me something. I have again had all the details of the suicides told me, but I have discovered nothing new. As far as the cause of the suicides were concerned, she had her own opinions. As for the actor, she thought he had had an unhappy love affair. When he had been her guest a year before, he had been visited frequently by a young woman who had not come at all this year. She admittedly couldn't quite make out why the Swiss gentleman had decided to commit suicide. But, of course, one could know everything. But there was no doubt that the police sergeant had committed suicide only to spite her. I must confess, these explanations of Madame Dubonnet's are rather inadequate. But I let her gabble on. At least she helps break up my boredom. Thursday, March 3rd. Still nothing. The commissioner rings me up several times a day and I tell him that everything is going splendidly. Evidently this information doesn't quite satisfy him. I have taken out my medical books and begun to work. In this way I am at least getting something out of my voluntary confinement. Friday, March 4th, 2 p.m. I had an excellent luncheon. Madame Dubonnet herself brought half bottle of champagne along with it. It was the kind of dinner you get before your execution. She already regards me as being three-fourths dead. Before she left me, she wept and begged me to go with her. Apparently, she is afraid I might also hang myself, just to spite her. I have examined the new curtain cord in considerable detail. So, I am to hang myself with that? Well, I can't say that I feel much like doing it. The cord is rotten hard, and it would make a good slip knot only with difficulty. One would have to be pretty powerfully determined to emulate the example of the other three suicides in order to make a success of the job. But now I'm sitting at the table, the telephone at my left, the revolver at my right. I certainly have no fear, but I am curious. 6 p.m. Nothing happened. I almost write with regret. The crucial hour came and went, and was just like all the others. Frankly, I can't deny that Sometimes I felt a certain urge to go to the window. Oh, yes, but for other reasons. The commissioner called me up at least ten times between five and six. He was just as impatient as I was, but Madame Dubonnet is satisfied. Someone has lived for a week in number seven without hanging himself. Miraculous. Monday, March 7. I am not convinced that I shall discover nothing and I am inclined to think that the Swiss of my predecessors were a matter of pure coincidence. I have asked the commissioner to go over all the evidence in all three cases again, for I am convinced that eventually a solution to the mystery will be found. But as far as I am concerned, I intend to stay here as long as possible. I probably will not conquer Paris, but in the meantime I am living here free and I am already gaining considerably in health and weight. On top of it all, I'm studying a great deal, and I notice I am rushing through in great style. And of course, there is another reason that keeps me here. Wednesday, March 9th. I've progressed another step. Clarimonde. Oh, but I haven't said a word about Clarimonde yet. Well, she is my third reason for staying here. And it would have been for her sake that I would gladly have gone to the window in the fateful hour but certainly not to hang myself. Clarimonde. But why do I call her that? I haven't the least idea as to what her name might be, but it seems to me as if I simply must call her Clarimonde. And I'd like to bet that some day I'll find out that that is really her name. I noticed Clarimonde during the first few days I was here. She lives on the other side of this very narrow street and her window is directly opposite mine. She sits there, back of her curtains. And let me also say that she noticed me before I was aware of her, and that she visibly manifested an interest in me. No wonder. 
Everyone on the street knows that I am here, and knows why, too. Madame Dubonnet saw to that. I am in no way the kind of person who falls in love. My relations with women have always been very slight. When one comes to Paris from Verdun to study medicine and hardly has enough money to have a decent meal once every three days, one has other things besides love to worry about. I haven't much experience, and I probably began this affair pretty stupidly. Anyhow, it's quite satisfactory as it stands. At first, it never occurred to me to establish communications with my strange neighbor. I simply decided that since I was here to make observations, and I probably had nothing real to investigate anyhow, I might as well observe my neighbor while I was at it. After all, one can't pore over one's books all day long. So I have come to the conclusion that judging from appearances, Clarimond lives all alone in her little apartment. She has three windows, but she sits only at the one directly opposite mine. She sits there and spins, spins at a little old-fashioned distaff. I once saw such a distaff at my grandmother's, but even my grandmother never used it. It was merely an heirloom left her by some great aunt or other. I didn't know that they were still in use. For that matter, Clarimond's distaff is a very tiny, fine thing, white and apparently made of ivory. The thread she spins must be infinitely fine. She sits behind her curtain all day long and works incessantly, stopping only when it gets dark. Of course, it gets dark very early these foggy days. In this narrow street, the loveliest twilight comes about five o'clock. I have never seen a light in her room. How does she look? Well, I really don't know. She wears her black hair in wavy curls and is rather pale. Her nose is small and narrow and her nostrils quiver. Her lips are pale too and it seems as if her little teeth might be pointed like those of a beast of prey. Her eyelids throw long shadows. When she opens them her large dark eyes are full of light. Yet I seem to sense rather than know all this it is difficult to identify anything clearly back of those curtains. One thing further, she always wears a black closely buttoned dress with large purple dots and she always wears long black gloves probably to protect her hands while working. It looks strange to see her narrow black fingers quickly taking and drawing the threads seemingly almost through each other really almost like the wriggling of an insect's legs. Our relations with each other? Oh, they are really quite superficial, and yet it seems as if they were truly much deeper. It began by her looking over to my window and my looking over to hers. She noticed me and I her, and then I evidently must have pleased her because one day when I looked at her she smiled. And of course I did too. That went on for several days, and we smiled at each other more and more. Then I decided almost every hour that I would greet her. I don't know exactly what it is that keeps me from carrying out my decision. I have finally done it this afternoon, and Clarimond returned the greeting. Of course the greeting was ever so slight, but nevertheless I distinctly saw her nod. Thursday, March 10th. Last night, I sat up late over my books. I can't truthfully say that I studied a great deal. I spent my time building air castles and dreaming about Clarimont. I slept very lightly, but very late into the morning. When I stepped up to the window, Clarimont was sitting at hers. I greeted her, and she nodded. She smiled, and looked at me for a long time. I wanted to work, but couldn't seem to find the necessary peace of mind. I sat at the window and stared at her. Then I suddenly noticed that she too folded her hand in her lap. I pulled at the cord of the white curtain and practically at the same instant she did the same. We both smiled and looked at one another. I believe we must have sat like that for an hour. Then she began spinning again. 
Saturday, March 12th. These days pass swiftly. I eat and drink and sit down to work. I light my pipe and bend over my books, but I don't read a word. Of course, I always make the attempt, but I know beforehand that it won't do any good. Then I go to the window. I greet Claremont and she returns my greeting. We smile and gaze at one another for hours. Yesterday afternoon at six, I felt a little uneasy. Darkness settled very early and I felt a certain nameless fear. I sat at my desk and waited. I felt an almost unconquerable urge to go to the window, certainly not to hang myself, but to look at Claremont. I jumped up and stood back of the curtain. It seemed as if I had never seen her so clearly, although it was already quite dark. She was spinning, but her eyes looked across at me. I felt a strange comfort and a very subtle fear. The telephone rang. I was furious at the silly old commissioner for interrupting my dreams with his stupid questions. This morning he came to visit me along with Madame du Bonnet. She seems to be satisfied enough with my activities. She takes sufficient consolation from the fact that I have managed to live in room number seven for two whole weeks. But the commissioner wants results. Besides, I confided to him that I had made some secret observations and that I was tracking down a very strange clue. The old fool believed all I told him. In any event, I can stay here for weeks. And that's all I care about. Not on account of Madame du Bonnet's cooking and cellar. God, how soon one becomes indifferent to that when one always has enough to eat. Only because of the window, which she hates and fears, and which I love so dearly. This window that reveals Clarimonde to me. When I light the lamp, I no longer see her. I have strained my eyes, trying to see whether she goes out, but I have never seen her set foot on the street. I have a comfortable easy chair in a green lampshade, whose glow warmly suffuses me. The commissioner has sent me a large package of tobacco. I have never smoked such good tobacco, and yet I cannot do any work. I read two or three pages, and when I have finished, I realize that I haven't understood a word of their contents. My eyes grasp the significance of the letters, but my brain refuses to supply the connotations. Queer. Just as if my brain bore the legend. No admittance. Just as if he refused to admit any thought other than the one. Claremont. Finally, I push my books aside. Lean far back in my chair and dream. Sunday, March 13. This morning I witnessed a little tragedy. I was walking up and down in the corridor while the porter made up my room. In front of the little court window, there is a spider web hanging, with a fat garden spider sitting in the middle of it. Madame du Bonnet refuses to let it be swept away. Spiders bring luck, and heaven knows she has had enough bad luck in her house. Presently I saw another much smaller male spider cautiously running around the edge of the web. Tentatively he ventured down one of the precarious threads towards the middle, but the moment the female moved, he hastily withdrew. He ran around to another end of the web and tried again to approach her. Finally, the powerful female spider in the center of the web seemed to look upon his suit with favor and stopped moving. The male spider pulled at one of the threads of the web, first lightly, then so vigorously that the whole web quivered. But the object of his attention remained immovable. Then he approached her very quickly, but carefully. The female spider received him quietly, and let him embrace her delicately while she retained the utmost passivity. Motionless, the two of them hung for several minutes in the center of the large web. Then I saw how the male spider slowly freed himself, one leg after another. It seemed as if he wanted to retreat quietly, leaving his companion alone in her dream of love. Suddenly, he let her go entirely and ran out of the web as fast as he could. But at the same instant, the female seemed to awaken to a wild rush of activity, and she chased rapidly after him. The weak male spider let himself down by a thread, but the female followed immediately. 
Both of them fell to the windowsill, and gathering all his energies, the male spider tried to run away, but it was too late. The female spider seized him in a powerful grip, carried him back up into the net, and set him down squarely in the middle of it. And this same place, that had just been a bed for passionate desire, now became the scene of something quite different. The lover, kicked in vain, stretched his weak legs out again and again, and tried to disentangle himself from this wild embrace. But the female would not let him go. In a few minutes she had spun him in so completely that he could not move a single member. Then she thrust her sharp pincers into his body and sucked out the young blood of her lover in deep draughts. I even saw how she finally let go of the pitiful, unrecognizable little lump, legs, skin, and threads, and threw it contemptuously out of the net. So that's what love is like among these creatures. Well, I can be glad I'm not a young spider. Monday, March 14. I no longer so much as glance at my books. Only at the window do I pass all my days. And I keep on sitting there even after it gets dark. Then she is no longer there. But I close my eyes and see her anyhow. While this diary has become quite different than I thought it would be. It tells about Madame Dubonnet and the Commissioner, about spiders and about Clarimonde, but not a word about the discovery I had hoped to make. Well, is it my fault? Tuesday, March 15th. Clarimonde and I have discovered a strange new game, and we play it all day long. I greet her, and immediately she returns the greeting. Then I drum with my fingers on my window pane. She has hardly had time to see it before she begins drumming on hers. I wink at her, and she winks at me. I move my lips, as if I were talking to her, and she follows suit. Then I brush the hair back from my temples, and immediately her hand is at the side of her forehead. Truly child's play, and we both laugh at it. That is, she really doesn't laugh. It's only a quiet, passive smile she has, just as I suppose mine must be. For that matter, all this isn't nearly as senseless as it must seem. It isn't imitation at all. I think we could both tire of that very quickly. There must be a certain telepathy or thought transference involved in it, for Clermont repeats my motions in the smallest conceivable fraction of a second. She hardly has time to see what I am doing before she does the same thing. Sometimes it even seems to me that her action is simultaneous with mine. That is what entices me, always doing something new and unpremeditated, and it's astounding to see her doing the same thing at the same time. Sometimes I try to catch her. I make a great many motions in quick succession and then repeat them again, and then I do them a third time, finally repeat them for the fourth time, but change their order, introduce some new motion, or leave out one of the old ones. It's like children playing follow the leader. It's really remarkable that Clermont never makes a single mistake, although I sometimes change the motion so rapidly that she hardly has time to memorize each one. That is how I spend my days. But I never feel for a second that I'm squandering my time on something nonsensical. On the contrary, it seems as if nothing I had ever done were more important. Wednesday, March 16. Isn't it queer that I have never thought seriously about putting my relations with Clermont on a more sensible basis than that of these hour-consuming games? I thought about it last night. I could simply take my hat and coat and go down two flights of stairs, five steps across the street, and then up two other flights of stairs. On her door there is a little coat of arms engraved with her name, Clermont, Clermont what? I don't know what. But the name Clermont is certainly there. Then I could knock and then, that far I can imagine very perfectly, down to the last move I might make. But for the life of me I can't picture what would happen to after that. The door would open. I can conceive that. But I would remain standing in front of it, looking into her room, into a darkness, a darkness so utter that not a solitary thing could be distinguished in it. 
she would not come. Nothing would come, as a matter of fact. There would be nothing there, only the black, impenetrable darkness. Sometimes it seems as if there could be no other Clermont than the one I play with at my window. I can't picture what this woman would look like if she wore a hat, or even some dress other than her black one with the large purple dots. I can't even conceive of her without her gloves. If I could see her on the street, or even in some restaurant, eating, drinking, talking. Well, I really have to laugh. The thing seems so utterly inconceivable. Sometimes I ask myself whether I love her. I can't answer that question entirely, because I have never been in love. But if the feeling I bear towards Claremont is really, well, love, then love is certainly very, very different from what I saw of it among my acquaintances or learned about it in novels. It is becoming quite difficult to define my emotions. In fact, it is becoming difficult even to think about anything at all that has no bearing on Clermont, or rather on our game. For there is truly no denying it, it's really the game that preoccupies me, nothing else, and that's the thing I understand least of all. Clermont well, yes, I feel attracted to her, but mingled with the attraction there is another feeling, almost like a sense of fear. Fear? No, it isn't fear either. It is more of a temerity, a certain inarticulate alarm or apprehension before something I cannot define. And it is just this apprehension that has some strange compulsion, something curiously passionate that keeps me at a distance from her and at the same time draws me constantly nearer to her. It is as if I were going around her in a wide circle, came a little nearer at one place, withdrew again, went on, approached her again at another point, and again retreated rapidly, until finally, of that I am absolutely certain, I must go to her. Clermont is sitting at her window and spinning, threads, long, thin, infinitely fine threads. She seems to be making some fabric. I don't know just what it is to be, and I can't understand how she can make the network without tangling or tearing the delicate fabric. There are wonderful patterns in her work, patterns full of fabulous monsters and curious grotesques. For that matter, but what am I writing? The fact of the matter is that I can't even see what it is she's spinning. The threads are much too fine, and yet I can't help feeling that her work must be exactly as I see it when I close my eyes. Exactly. A huge network peopled with many creatures, fabulous monsters, and curious, grotesque. Thursday, March 17th. I find myself in a strange state of agitation. I no longer talk to anyone. I hardly even say good morning to Madame de Bonnet or the porter. I hardly take time to eat. I only want to sit at the window and play with her. It's an exciting game, truly it is. And I have a premonition that tomorrow something must happen. Friday, March 18. Yes, yes, something must happen today. I tell myself, oh yes, I talk aloud just to hear my own voice. That is just for that I am here. But the worst of it is that I am afraid, and this fear that what has happened to my predecessors in this room may also happen to me is curiously mingled with my other fear, the fear of Clermont. I can hardly keep them apart. I am afraid. I would like to scream. 6 p.m. Let me put down a few words quickly and then get into my hat and coat. By the time five o'clock came, my strength was gone. Oh, I know now for certain that it must have something to do with this sixth hour of the next to the last day of the week. Now, I can no longer laugh at the fraud with which I duped the commissioner. I sat on my chair and stayed there only by exerting my willpower to the utmost. But this thing drew me almost pulled me to the window. I had to play with Claremont, and there again 
there rose that terrible fear of the window. I saw them hanging there. The Swiss traveling salesman, a large fellow with a thick neck and a gray stubble beard, and the lanky acrobat, and a stocky, powerful police sergeant. I saw all three of them, one after another, and then all three together, hanging from the same hook, with open mouths and with tongues lolling far out. And then I saw myself among them. Oh, this is fear. I felt I was as much afraid of the window sash and the terrible hook as I was of Claremont. May she forgive me for it, but that's the truth. In my ignominious fear, I always confused her image with that of the three who hang there, dangling their legs heavily on the floor. But the truth is that I never felt for an instant any desire or inclination to hang myself. I wasn't even afraid I would do it. No, I was afraid only of the window itself and of Claremont and of something terrible, something uncertain and unpredictable that was now to come. I had the pathetic, irresistible longing to get up and go to the window, and I had to do it. Then the telephone rang. I grabbed the receiver, and before I could hear a word, I myself cried into the mouthpiece, Come! Come at once! It was just as if my unearthly yell had instantly chased all the shadows into the farthest cracks of the floor. I became composed immediately. I wiped the sweat from my forehead and drank a glass of water. Then I considered what I ought to tell the commissioner when he came. Finally, I went to the window, greeted Claremont, and smiled. And Claremont greeted me and smiled. Five minutes later, the commissioner was here. I told him that I had finally struck the root of the whole affair. If he would only refrain from questioning me today, I would certainly be able to make some remarkable disclosure in the very near future. The queer part of it was that while I was lying to him, I was at the same time fully convinced in my own mind that I was telling the truth. And I still feel that that is the truth against my better judgment. He probably noticed the unusual condition of my temper, especially when I apologized for screaming into the telephone and tried to explain and failed to find any plausible reason for my agitation. He suggested very amiably that I need not make any undue consideration of him. He was always at my service. That was his duty. He would rather make a dozen useless trips over here than let me wait for him once when I really needed him. Then he invited me to go out with him tonight, suggesting that might help distract me. It wasn't a good thing to be alone all the time. I've accepted his invitation, although I think it will be difficult to go out. I don't like to leave this room. Saturday, March 19. We went to the Gate Rochor, to the Segal, and to the Lune Russe. The commissioner was right. It was a good thing for me to go out and breathe another atmosphere. At first I felt rather uncomfortable, as if I were doing something wrong, as if I were a deserter, running away from our flag. But by and by that feeling died. We drank a good deal, laughed and joked. When I went to the window this morning, I seemed to read a reproach in Claremont's look. But perhaps I only imagined it. How could she know that I had gone out last night? For that matter, it seemed to last for only a moment. Then she smiled again. We played all day long. Sunday, March 20th. Today, I can only repeat, we played all day long. Monday, March 21st, we played all day long. Tuesday, March 22nd, yes, and today we did the same. Nothing, absolutely nothing else. Sometimes I ask myself why we do it. What is it all for? Or what do I really want? To what can it all lead? But I never answer my own question, for it's certain that I want nothing other than just this. Come what may, that which is coming is exactly what I long for. We have been talking to one another these last few days, of course. Not with any spoken word. Sometimes we moved our lips. At other times, we only looked at one another. But we understood each other perfectly. I was right. Claremont reproached me for running away last Friday. 
but I begged her forgiveness and told her I realized that it had been very unwise and horrid of me. She forgave me, and I promised her never again to leave the window. And we kissed each other, pressing our lips against the panes for a long, long time. Wednesday, March 23rd. I know now that I love her. It must be love. I feel it tingling in every fiber of my being. It may be that with other people's love is different, but is there anyone among a thousand million who has a head, an ear, a hand that is like anyone else's? Everyone is different, so it is quite conceivable that our love is very singular. But does that make it any less beautiful? I am almost happy in this love. If only there would not be this fear. Sometimes it falls asleep, and I forget, but only for a few minutes. Then it wakes up again and will not let me go. It seems to me like a poor little mouse fighting against a huge and beautiful snake, trying to free itself from its overpowering embrace. Just wait, you poor foolish little fear. Soon our love will devour you. Thursday, March 24. I've made a discovery. I don't play with Claremont. She plays with me. It all happened like this. Last night, as usual, I thought about our game. I wrote down five intricate movements with which I wanted to surprise her today. I gave every motion a number. I practiced them to be able to execute them as quickly as possible, first in order and then backwards, then only the even numbers and then the odd, and then only the first and last parts of each of the five motions. It was very laborious, but it gave me great satisfaction, because it brought me nearer to Clermont. Even though I could not see her, I practiced in this way for hours, and finally they went like clockwork. This morning I went to the window, we greeted each other, and the game began. Forward, backward, it was incredible to see how quickly she understood me, and how instantaneously she repeated all the things I did. Then there was a knock at my door. It was the porter bringing me my boots. I took them, but when I was going back to the window, my glance fell on the sheet of paper on which I had recorded the order of the movements, and I saw that I had not executed a single one of these movements. I almost reeled. I grabbed the back of the easy chair and let myself down into it. I couldn't believe it. I read the sheet again and again, but it was true. Of all the motions I had made at the windows, not a single one was mine. And again I was aware of a door opening somewhere far away, her door. I was standing before it and looking in. Nothing, nothing, only an empty darkness. Then I knew that if I went out, I would be saved. And I realized that now I could go. Nevertheless, I did not go. That was because I was distinctly aware of one feeling, that I held the secret of the mystery, held it tightly in both hands. Paris, I was going to conquer Paris. For a moment, Paris was stronger than Clermont. Oh, I've dropped all thought of it now. Now I'm aware only of my love and in the midst of this, this quiet, passionate fear. But in that instant, I felt suddenly strong. I read through the details of my first movement, once more and impressed it firmly in my memory. Then I went back to the window, and I took exact notice of what I did. Not a single motion I executed was amongst those I had set out to do. Then I decided to run my index finger along my nose, but instead I kissed the window pane. I wanted to drum on the window sill, but ran my hand through my hair instead. So it was true. Claremont did not imitate the things I did. On the contrary, I repeated the things she indicated, and I did it so quickly, with such lightning rapidity that I followed her motions in the same second, so that even now it seems as if I were the one who exerted the willpower to do these things. So it is I. I was so proud of the fact that I had determined her mode of thought. I was the one who was being so completely influenced. Only her influence is so soft, so gentle, that it seems as if nothing on earth could be so soothing. I made other experiments. 
I put both my hands in my pockets and resolved firmly not to move them. Then I looked across at her. I noticed how she lifted her hand and smiled, and gently chided me with her index finger. I refused to budge. I felt my right hand wanting to take itself out of my pocket, but I dug my fingers deep into the pocket lining. Then slowly, after several minutes, my fingers relaxed. My hand came out of the pocket and I lifted my arm. And I chided her with my index finger and smiled. It seemed as if it were not really I who was doing all this, but some stranger whom I watched from a distance. No, no, that wasn't the way of it. I, I was the one who did it, and some stranger was watching me. It was the stranger, that other me, who was so strong, who wanted to solve this mystery with some great discovery. But that was no longer I. I? Oh, what do I care about the discovery? I am only here to do her bidding, the bidding of my Clermont, whom I love with such tender fear. Friday, March 25th. I have cut the telephone wire. I can no longer stand being perpetually bothered by the silly old commissioner, least of all when the fateful hour is at hand. God, why am I writing all this? Not a word of it is true. It seems as if someone else were guiding my pen. But I do. I want to set down here what actually happens. It is costing me a tremendous effort. But I want to do it, if only for the last time, to do what I really want to do. I cut the telephone wire. Oh, because I had to. There, I finally got it out. Because I had to. I had to. We stood at the window this morning and played. Our game has changed a little since yesterday. She goes through some motions and I defend myself as long as possible. Until finally I have to surrender and powerless to do anything but her bidding. And I can scarcely tell what a wonderful sense of exaltation and joy it gives me to be conquered by her will to make this surrender. We played, and then suddenly she got up and went back into her room. It was so dark that I couldn't see her. She seemed to disappear into the darkness. But she came back very shortly, carrying in her hands a desk telephone, just like mine. Smiling, she set it down on the window sill, took a knife, cut the wire, and carried it back again. I defended myself for about a quarter of an hour. My fear was greater than ever, but that made my slow surrender all the more delectable. And I finally brought my telephone to the window, cut the wire, and set it back on the table. That is how it happened. I am sitting at the table. I have had my tea, and the porter has just taken the dishes out. I asked him what time it was. It seems my watch is in keeping time. It's 5.15. 5.15. I know that if I look up now, Clermont will be doing something or other, doing something or other that I will have to do too. I look up anyhow. She is standing there and smiling. Well, if I could only tear my eyes away from her. Now she is going to the curtain. She is taking the cord off. It is red just like the one on my window. She is tying a knot, a slip knot. She is hanging the cord up on the hook in the window sash. She is sitting down and smiling. No, this is no longer a thing one can call fear. This thing I experience. It is maddening, choking terror. But nevertheless, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It is a compulsion of an unheard of nature and power, yet so subtly sensual in its inescapable ferocity. Of course, I could rush up to the window and do exactly what she wants me to do. But I am waiting, struggling, and defending myself. I feel this uncanny thing getting stronger every minute. So, here I am, still sitting here, I ran quickly to the window and did the thing she wanted me to do. I took the curtain cord, tied a slip knot in it, and hung it from the hook. And now I am not going to look up any more. I am going to stay here and look only at this sheet of paper, for I know now what she would do if I looked up again. And now in the sixth hour 
of the next to the last day of the week. If I see her, I shall have to do her bidding. I shall have to. I shall refuse to look at her. But I am suddenly laughing, loudly. No, I'm not laughing. It is something laughing within me. I know why, too. It's because of this. I will not. I don't want to, and yet I know certainly that I must. I must. I must look at her. Must. Must do it, and then the rest. I'm only waiting to stretch out the moment. Yes, that is it. For these breathless sufferings are my most rapturous transports. I'm writing quickly, quickly, so that I can remain sitting here longer in order to stretch out these seconds of torture which carry the ecstasy of love into infinity. More? Longer? Again this fear, again, I know that I shall look at her, that I shall get up, that I shall hang myself. But it isn't that far I fear. Oh no, that is sweet, that is beautiful. But there's something else, something else associated with it, something that will happen afterwards. I don't know what it will be, but it is coming. It is certainly coming, certainly, certainly. For the joy of my torments is so infinitely great. Oh, I feel it is so great that something terrible must follow it. Only I must not think. Let me write something, anything, no matter what. Only quickly, without thinking. My name. Richard Bracamont. Richard Bracamont. Richard. Oh, I can't go any further. Richard Bracamont. Richard Bracamont. Now. Now, I must look at her. Richard Bracamont. I must, no, no, more, more, Richard, Richard Bracamont. The commissioner of the ninth ward, after finally failing repeatedly to get a reply to his telephone calls, came to the Hotel Stevens at five minutes to six. In room number seven, he found the body of the student, Richard Bracamont hanging from the window sash in exactly the same position as that of his three predecessors. Only his face had a different expression. It was distorted in a horrible fear, and his eyes, wide open, seemed to be pushing themselves out of their sockets. His lips were drawn apart, but his powerful teeth were firmly and desperately clenched. And glued between them, bitten and crushed to pieces, there was a large black spider with curious purple dots. On the table lay the medical student's diary. The commissioner read it and went immediately to the house across the street. There he discovered that the second apartment had been vacant and unoccupied for months and months.